It's time for the comment positivity section. And this is where I'm just going to pick out a number of comments that either made me smile or laugh, or perhaps were helpful or insightful, or asked an interesting question that I'd like to deal with in greater depth. So, reading glasses on, and we'll begin. So, cool outhouse. So, I mentioned in my pickle video, in my lacto-fermenting pickling video, that I was going to store the pickles in an outhouse. That made a few Americans chuckle, because the outhouse means something quite distinct in America, but let's go and have a look at that outhouse right now. We're standing at the moment in the oldest bit of Shrimp Cottage. This is the Victorian part of the cottage. The kitchen is an extension, and this was added in, I think, about 1950 or something like that. And it goes through to what I called an outhouse. Now, let me show you why I called that an outhouse. Because I think this bit is older than the kitchen. Uh, and I think this was an outhouse. I think this was an outdoor toilet. And when the kitchen was built to link the house to the outhouse, the toilet was moved into here. But I think it was originally here because there's drainage and stuff here. And hello, Doggo. Look at this door. We haven't seen anything quite like that. I'll show you what's behind here. So that's the back wall of the kitchen, and that's the retaining wall that goes up to the little bank up there. And so for this outhouse, for this utility room, whatever, whatever you want to call it, this back wall is the retaining wall. So you wouldn't have built habitation like that normally. <laughs> There's a snail up there. Um, yeah, we've had all sorts of interesting things come in through this gap here. We've just cemented up that little gap at the bottom there because there was a pipe that ran, a drainage pipe that ran out to that drain there. And we're gonna have a better door fitted here because we get frogs and snails and wood lice and damp loving creatures coming in from this little passage out the back here. Not really quite sure what we can do with this space here, but we'll think of something. But this room, which has got a back wall that's underground essentially, stays really cool. And in winter, it's just like an enormous fridge. So this is kind of cellar temperature, so a great place to store beer. Probably quite a good place to store pickles and preserves and things like that. We'll probably replace that shelving. And I think that snail might have to go back out in the garden. So uh, that snail can go down there. I'm really not that worried about snails in this garden. In fact, snails are food for glowworms, food for thrushes. They are just part of the whole system. I will control them in the vegetable garden, but in the rest of the garden, I'm not very worried about having snails munching on things. So yeah, it probably was an outhouse at one point, so I, I called it an outhouse. It's really our utility room. Anyway, uh, all right, hey shrimp, your cheese reminded me of Mary's Test Kitchen. It's a channel full of different recipes to do tofu-like stuff using different ingredients with the old tofu method. Maybe that could give you some ideas to play around with as the chickpea cheese method is really close in essence. Yeah, I, I was aware of that channel actually. I, I literally only stumbled across it just a couple of days before this comment. Um, but yeah, Mary's Test Kitchen, the thing that really struck me there was they did a pumpkin seed tofu and they were quite surprised that it seized and curdled without any chemical additives. That, when I was watching it, immediately didn't surprise me because it made me think of Babatunde's egusi recipe. Egusi is an African melon seed soup. It's made from ground up melon seeds, essentially pumpkin seeds, ground up. And when it's cooked, the boiling process just causes it to coagulate into rubbery lumps Rubbery lumps doesn't sound very appetising, but actually it's like tofu-like lumps of chewy protein. Anyway, yeah, I shall be trying to use that effect with the pumpkin seeds for something else that I've got in the pipeline that's coming soon. Uh, so, someone mentioned on my pickle tasting and fake cheese pizza video, no such thing as authentic pizza. Pizza is one of those foods that you make with what you happen to have. In that sense, it's very authentic. Spot on, absolutely right. Really interesting that people get so hung up on authentic pizza when in fact pizzas 
one of those foods that people made because all they had was a bit of bread and some onions and tomatoes or a bit of bread and a bit of cheese and it's just like throw together what you've got and make it into a meal rather than a snack so yeah in that sense authentic pizza is when you throw whatever you've got together and it comes out looking a bit like something on bread a couple of comments on that fake cheese thing that i made great video really interesting how all the food stuff's linked together have you tried grilling the fake cheese like halloumi on a barbecue and just at the bit where you start the cheese and say the fake cheese doesn't melt like cheese but then halloumi doesn't melt like cheese either but it is cheese nonetheless so yeah i, I did actually test a little bit of that fake cheese and I, but i only showed a tiny bit of the video i cut a couple of slices of it and i put it under the grill that's a broiler for americans so it's underneath radiant heat and i grilled it until it crisped up on the outside and the result was not like halloumi but it was like one of those cheeses that you grill so it's a bit softer than halloumi maybe a bit more like paneer or something like that but yes it definitely crisped up and it was quite tasty like that it was really nice to eat actually just like that and i'm thinking that you could cut slices of that fake cheese bread them and deep fry them and they would be a fantastic and delicious little non-dairy but still cheese-like snack uh, I have a request, would you please make mushroom ketchup? It's not in America and I would like a recipe to base mine off. So I will make mushroom ketchup. I, it is on my never-ending list of things to do. I think I'm probably going to wait until I can forage a large amount of mushrooms to make it with. So that's probably going to be nearer the late summer, autumn sort of part of the year. Meanwhile, if you want a recipe to make mushroom ketchup, I can thoroughly recommend the Townsend's mushroom ketchup recipe on the Townsend's channel. I'll put a link in the description for that and there'll be one in this card here as well. Uh, <laughs> oh, a little comment on one of my shorts. I like how this one loops, good timing. Uh, looping shorts, there are several reasons why people do them actually. One of the worst reasons to loop shorts is to make you watch it more than once um, accidentally. So when any short, if you ever see wait for it in the thumbnail, it, you'll be waiting forever because what it often means is there's a looping short and you'll be sitting there waiting for something to happen and nothing ever does and before you realize it you've watched the video five times and that's five views for the person who published it slap me around the face if i ever do that because i don't i don't approve of it uh but the reason i looped my most recent two shorts was it kind of bookends the ideas because the short had a kind of story it had a narrative that it was like here's a concept here's the explanation here's the recap the recap and the introduction are actually very similar and so I found it convenient to think of those as looping back on themselves. That's why I did the looping short. It's not actually very difficult to do and it is a bit of a gimmick so I will only do it when there's a reason to. Anyway, I have a serious question to ask you Shrimp. How is it you're living your life so comfortably and yet so happy? I love your videos and admire how chill you are. Well, thank you, it's really nice of you to say that and I do actually get a lot of people say that I seem very contented and very happy um, and I must have a very nice life. I think, you know, please don't put me on a pedestal. I'm just a normal bloke. Uh, I haven't got it all solved, but I am in a reasonably good place in my life at the moment. Uh, you could say that I've worked to get where I am at the moment, but I think that would be neglecting to remember that actually yes I put in a lot of hard work to do what I do and to get what I wanted but at the same time there was a huge element of luck uh, you have to be lucky for your hard work to actually pay off and I have been very lucky and I'm, and I'm really appreciative of the fact that I'm in a position where my life has got a lot of the things in it that I like at the moment it has it hasn't always been like that but my life at the moment, quite in a decent place that I'm reasonably happy with. Even when it's not like that though, I mean, it hasn't always been like that though. And there are examples of videos on my channel where you can see that I was really stressed. The one unboxing the scam that was sunglasses and then it was a weird car rear view mirror thing. I keep that video there as a reminder of the bad times. Um, I keep that video up because you watch that video and I was out of breath, I was stressed, uh, fingernails bitten to the quick, I was not in a good place and that was only a few years ago. Uh, work has often been quite stressful for me in the past. Since I've gone full-time on YouTube and I'm now my own boss, I only have my, <laughs> I only have myself to hold accountable for the bad things that happened to me. 
So that's a good thing. Um, but I did reply to this comment actually, and I've been think I've been thinking some more about why is it that I seem to be a happy person. Um, I think I am a happy person actually. I, I think it's because I am a happy person. I think it's because I do that on purpose. So I'm just going to read the reply actually I wrote to that, and I'll expand on it a little bit. So I, I just said I might do a whole video on this. I think it does deserve a whole video to answer this question about how are you living your life so comfortably and yet so happy. I am incredibly lucky that the things I like doing have collided with the things that make me money in running this channel. I did make that happen. I put in over a decade of effort before my YouTube channel went anywhere at all. But again, as I say, there's a lot of luck in that success taking root and actually coming to fruition. But part of why on a day-to-day -day basis, and maybe in the videos, I f might appear to be positive or, or happy, it's just because I've realised that there are a lot of little things that anyone can do that make us happy when we do them. And you can do them on purpose. And so a lot of what I do on the channel is kind of directed towards I'm doing things on purpose because I know that doing it will make me happy. Even if I feel like I don't want to do it, even if I get up and I feel a bit miserable, got a bit of a cold or something like that, I'm feeling a bit under the weather, something bad's happened, whatever, I know that doing those things will result in an improvement to my mood. And so I kind of force myself to do those things that will make me happy. And it works. And even if the bad thing is still going to happen, you can still be happy before the bad thing arrives. You know, if you know you've got to go to the dentist tomorrow, that's not a nice thing to look forward to. But there's 24 hours between now and then. You can do something in those 24 hours that will make you happy. And why not? If your choice is actually just sit here worrying about what's going to happen, or sit here doing something that's going to have a positive effect on your mental state, then why not do the good thing? Why not do that thing that's going to make you happy? The bad thing's going to happen anyway. Why not do the good thing and just have a, a bit of enjoyment and pleasure in life before the bad thing washes over you? So that's part of it. And some of it's just really silly little things as well. Like, big onions make me happy. When I'm at the mar the market or the supermarket and I find a really big onion, I don't know why, it's a stupid little thing, but it always makes me happy. And so I make a point of looking for big onions and girthy carrots and just just saying the words girthy carrot makes me happy. So I make a point of, if you've been watching any of my videos over the last year or two, you've probably heard the words girthy carrot come out of my mouth. Um, saying the words girthy carrot, <laughs> girthy carrot makes me happy it's doing it right now um, lots of silly little things they're all different for different people so I'm not saying do the things that I do that make me happy but there are bound to be some things that will bring joy to your life and little inexpensive sometimes even money saving things that you can do and choose to do to make yourself happy I thought about this a little bit more on my recent foraging video actually and I did this kind of mind map thing that I put together and this is only part of the picture of, of what directs me to happiness but when I put it down on paper on this mind map I realised how much of what I do in foraging and cooking and all of the kind of economising and stuff in the kitchen is actually done with an end goal of creating a bit of happiness. There are other things we could plug into this mind map but I would encourage you, if you're the same kind of thinker that I am, I don't know what, actually, I don't know what kind of thinker it is. It's probably a label for it, but mind maps make a lot of sense to me. Mind maps, like flowcharts of this thing leads to this thing, this thing causes this other thing, and doing that graphically in a mind map makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. In fact, I think I was drawing mind maps before I knew that mind maps were a thing that other people had, had invented. Anyway. I would, if you're that kind of thinker, that those things do make sense to you like that, I would really encourage you to sit down and map out the things that make you happy. Map out the things that lead to joy, satisfaction, comfort, happiness to you. Because you might not realise what all of them are until you actually put them down on paper like I did there. And once you put them down on paper and realise what they are, and you can see what leads to what, 
you can choose to try to do more of those things that will lead to the outcomes that you want. So I think that's about it for today's comment positivity section. Uh, thanks, thanks for all of your positive comments. I do read a lot of the comments, even though I can't obviously feature them all in here. I have noticed, I think, a bit of an uptick in people leaving positive comments, and I'm really liking the fact that I think some people are purposely being positive in the comments, even though that might not be obvious or might not be your first inclination to do. I think it's actually quite good to choose to do it anyway. It's about doing things that create happiness and positivity on purpose. So it kind of fits into the bit I've just spoken about. Anyway, on with the rest of the video. Basically fake Meccano. I bought this, uh, this was actually about a tenner, I think. I bought it on Amazon. Uh, transformation robot. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not the transformation robot you might have heard of. This is a completely different transformation robot. Anyway, this next bit of the video is going to turn into an episode of I Can Unbox Anything, because here we are. The model is novel, easy to assemble, suitable for children and adults. 215 pieces, assemble quantity. It is useful for the child's study. It studies while happily playing. It puts the lotion in the basket. Build children's imaginative faculty exercise by the various environment of sculpt. By using the products being different exterior and the different colour to build out the different building collocation, take child's imaginative faculty and the logic ability exercise. The products is also suitable to many people play at the same time. Can be improved the ability of communication between the child and their buddies. Well, that's uh, useful to know. Tools and instructions included. Assembling transformable, movable, multifunction, intelligent series. Okay, well, that's basically everything to read on the box. Oh, look, there is a sad onion. Um, zero to three years, not suitable for children under three years due to small parts. Made in China, choking hazard. So, we've got an assembly manual. Exploded diagrams. And we've got the pieces. And a little bit smaller than I thought they were going to be. I don't know if that's just because... I don't know if these are Meccano compatible or if this is just a kind of smaller set. We've got some little wheels there with rubber tyres on. So we've got four wheels, bag of bolts and nuts. Bag of plastic bits and bobs. And a bag of all the metal things. Together with... Very flimsy looking little spanner and an odd looking little Phillips or posi screwdriver there. Kind of old fashioned looking handle. Anyway, so that's the pieces. Let's have a look at the quality of these. They are just stamped out of metal and then nickel plated by the look of it. I'd say these are probably nickel plated rather than stainless. A little bit too bright for, for galvanised, I think. But yeah, they seem pretty good quality. There are no sharp edges here. Punching looks like it was a little bit hard there. It's dished, that piece, but who's checking? Okay, well, yeah, all looks good, really. Maybe not. Maybe that's the thing I will mount the motor on. I may have to drill some additional holes in some of these pieces, so that might seem like it defeats the object. I might have to cut some little notches or something. But anyway, hopefully we'll get to where we need to be. Uh, right. So I think before I go and just reuse these pieces to make my turntable thing, I am going to assemble this robot model. Transformation robot. Okay, I'm not going to bother to count all of these pieces and, and check that everything is here. I am going to crack on and begin assembly. Probably going to be shortened here. This is good actually, it's, so the parts are numbered. So I've got a reference here. Uh, except 3074. Where is 3074? Not described. <laughs> okay. 
3129 is that thing, that yellow thing. Well, at least we've got that. It looks like it's that. No, actually, it looks like it's the one that's only got three holes in the middle here. 1038. Well, this could go badly wrong, couldn't it? Because who knows? Do you know what? This, these instructions, there's just too much going on here. OK. So, 3129, which is this thing, goes onto the front of four of these, which there are four of. But they're also bolted onto something behind there. And I can't see what that is. Three one one seven. I think it's that thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and then there are two bolts, two bolts in this top one, and then one each in the bottom three. Alright, well let's see what we can this was easier when I was a child and didn't have quite such chunky fingers. Trouble is with this little spanner being as thin as it is, it's not even really thick enough to grip the, the nut. And these nuts and bolts feel a bit like they're cross-threading when they go in there. But they're not. They're just binding a little bit on their own thread. This one didn't do it so much. The first one it's actually quite difficult to get that tightened up because it's it's binding in some way. Okay, well there's that. Then one each in these three bits. Right. Okay, I think that's somewhere close to what we got. We could then these these bits go onto here. And these little, uh, what goes on the back? 3074. Oh, I see that's 3074. So, so that's 3074. So it's talking about the little plastic widgets that go on the back of here, which appear to be that thing. Uh, is that as far as it goes? I think it is. So that's probably going to be a bit of a loose fit. Okay, that's kind of there. Oh dear. Now that's interesting. <laughs> that obviously needs a bit of adjustment. I mean, what can you expect? It, 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 this was a tenner, this kit. The quality is about what's reasonable to expect for, for a kit of metal parts and metal and plastic parts that comes at that price point. It could do with a few more steps, I think. This is just a little bit kind of assuming that you just got everything together already. So you maybe should have just used one more sheet of paper and then it would have been a bit easier to actually get things clear where everything goes. Right. So 1034 is those double brackets there. So we've got those go on here. That's the kind of shoulder joint, I suppose. Then in the middle of that, We've got 1064, which is that joint, which is going to go in there. Now there's a conflict in the way that it's actually shown here. So it's this exploded diagram that goes across the middle here is showing me the is showing me the, the screw going through the red thing this way, but 
red things on this side of that bar so and the screw heads on that side I think it's just a case of use your imagination a little bit there so hmm, does it use two of these because it looks like it ought to I think I've done that wrong there's a bracket thing on there as well I don't think it actually make, made any difference. I tell you what, I'm going to do this bit first because it will hold it together. Right, so is that only one of those on there? Let's consult this picture. It does look like frustratingly we can't get a good view of it. It does look to me like there might be two of those things in that sandwich there. Oh well, might have to take one out if it turns out to be no good. No, it's one. Right, so because it's this one here, it's this sword thing here that he's holding. And it's only got one, so those two these two pieces here are actually squeezed together a little bit. Okay. Right, now I did miss a piece here. So I'm going to take this joint apart. Then these two blue plastic bits. Oh, we've got to do all of this as well. That's got to get fixed through this hole. But it doesn't say what kind oh yes it does right okay well let's put that aside because you've got to build this thing now so 1025 which is what is going on here so that's the other side of it right okay well there's that piece which is obviously that piece at the bottom there that's 3036. I don't think it can be two of these, even though there's two lines kind of implying there's two of these stacked on here. Oh, wait, no, it is, because that's, that bolt there is 1065. Flip an egg. It's 1069. Where's the... Oh, yeah, and there it is. There's the number pointing to it on the... On the diagram where you can't see it, yeah, okay, whatever. You know when I said I would build this before I started using the pieces? I kind of didn't think it was going to take quite as long as this. Some of these plastic pieces are so tight that you have to screw the screw through them. I suppose that's not necessarily a bad thing because it does mean it's not just going to fall apart while we're trying to assemble it. It does just make the assembly a tiny bit tedious. <laughs> My hands are going to cramp up in a minute. That's interestingly um, <sighs> bodged. Fitting straight pieces to a curved section doesn't feel like it's quite the right thing to do. Okay, we are getting somewhere. Uh, that's wrong. No, that's right. So far it looks like that. That's about right. Then we've got this little piece here, which has got to have two of these red pegs in it. which are going to have those things on the back. Okay. Then there's another one of these little things behind there to stand off. And then what kind of screw have we got through the middle? Does it tell me? 1025, is that a screw? Yes, it's the second size. Okay. Right, well, there's the kind of face. Okay, and then that has to go onto 
Uh, where? That's going to go under there. And is there anything goes on the back? Yes, this thing goes on the back with its other blue bit, which is gone right there. I wonder why, because that's not even going to be visible then. But Okay, well, let's go with it. Okay, well, it's starting to look a bit kind of roboty. That, I think, is everything on this page. That is step one. Felt like more than one step, didn't it? Okay, now we have to build a car. Do you know what? I think I'm going to leave that for the morning. All right, it's another day. And feeling suitably refreshed. Time for another crack at this. Right, where do we start? I suppose at the top. Maybe at the bottom. Well, yeah, start at the bottom and make the kind of chassis. Oh, tight put, push fit, that is. I better put the other axle in first. I would assume the same thing happens here, one of these red spaces. through the second hole that's quite a tight fit um, that would be difficult for a child to do and I immediately see what I've done wrong here because I'm going, to have, I'm going to struggle to get into that screw there. Okay, this axle comes off for a moment. In fact, I'm going to put the axles on last because I have a feeling that that's going to impede access to these screws and things. Okay, let's do it a different way. So, on the third hole in, See, this is why I, and maybe it's just me, I think this diagram, the assembly instructions are just a little bit dense. They're good, they are complete, they're accurate. That whole thing I did yesterday where I thought one of the pieces was misnumbered or whatever, I, I was wrong about that. I was just looking at the wrong thing and I wasn't actually following where the end of the line went. But I think these instructions are a bit dense. They are... <coughs> A little bit too much condensed into a single operation uh, I think it would have been better to actually break this into steps because of what I've just seen there for example it, you can't put the wheels on until you've put other bits on it would be better I think obviously it would take an extra sheet of paper or two but I think it would be better if we did that um, if that was shown as multiple steps Hello, little dog yeah, I think for one thing it would just be clearer anyway because there's so much going on in this diagram it's quite easy to miss something I'm not really sure of the extent to which I should tighten things up at this stage in case something else needs to be eased into position but I'm going to tighten these up now while I can get to them one thing I do like over traditional Meccano I haven't played with Meccano the real Meccano for years and years but as a child, I played a lot with Meccano. I had Meccano and I had Lego. And one of the problems with Meccano was that was the, the screws. The screws were, well, for one thing, Whitworth thread. I suspect these will be a metric thread now. Um, but the screws were slotted. And it just made it, the assembly a little bit more difficult. And I think this... Um, I don't know if this is Phillips or Posi or something else, but cross point screws here definitely make assembly that little bit more simple because you can 
center the screw on the screwdriver and get it ready. Anyway, got these two screws here. And they need to go through several layers of this arrangement. Three of these red things. Four sheets of this. Be interesting to see how many spare pieces I have left at the end of this. I'm imagining there will be one or two spare bolts and nuts. Um, I don't suppose there are going to be any spare pieces of framework. But we'll see. It would be kind of amazing if it has exactly the right number, wouldn't it? Let's put this bit together anyway. So it's this and two of these. I'll say this is not my favorite piece of the engineering. These little plastic pins with retaining clips on the back. Just not my favorite bit. Okay, and then another one of these goes on with red spacers and I've run out of red spacers. How have I run out of red spacers? Maybe I have to use green ones. I've got one red I've got two red spacers left now. Maybe that's the ones but then I need some for the axles. I've run out. Okay, I'm gonna count up that component. So supposedly I've got twenty one of those. Oh, hang on. Yeah, I've got 21 of the, the red and only six of the green. I, I can see I've definitely got more than six of the green there. So I think they might have just uh, substituted. Okay. So I will use these last two red spaces on this thing. I don't think they're going to matter quite so much anywhere else. Okay, well, here's a lesson. is Tighten these as you go. Because... Can't get to the middle one very easily otherwise. See on this one I can get the spanner in there and do that up. Whereas if you wait until it's done, wait until you've assembled all three, there isn't quite enough clearance to get that spanner in there, so you have to kind of go in from above like that, which is not gripping it quite so effectively. So there's one little lesson along the way. Right, now those pieces will go on to there. Right, well, I've got to go and walk Doggo now. So, take a break, let my hands recover from, it definitely is giving me the cramps. Okay, there's more to do, but we're getting somewhere. Not very many pieces left, so we must be getting near the end. Back in a moment. All right, back again now for the post-brunch session. And it should be kind of all downhill from here. So let's have a look. Well, we're going to make these pieces here. All right. And I think they go onto these type of bolts to go down through there. 1025. Let me just confirm that. Uh, no, it's the mead. It's the second size ones. Okay. Important not to use too long a bolt because the longer ones will be required elsewhere. These pieces onto the outside of here. A small pair of pliers would probably help here because I could grip the nut in a pair of pliers and that would enable me to get in there might help probably an extra pair of hands would be the thing that would be most useful to grow okay I just check I do have to do one of these at both ends yep right at least with that, I can actually hold it in place by just putting a bit of pressure on there. OK, 
Come on. Come on. There we go. Times like this, when you really wish there was such a thing as copy and paste in real life. All right, now I think I can just tighten those up. I probably should have done that before I copied and pasted. These bolt onto, right, feet, well, assuming these are feet, go onto one end of this. Interesting. Because I would have thought that would go on there like that, but apparently it goes on there like that. So we have a problem here, and in all of the past cases, problems were a result of me misunderstanding the instructions. However, that says 1025, but it looks longer than a 1025, which is only the second length of bolt. So that's, that's 1026, that's 1025. That's 1065. I think that's supposed to be 1065. Okay, can't be the other ones, they're just not long enough. So that there, I think is an error. I think that should be 1065 because that bolt can go through there into the foot. Let's hope that doesn't leave me short of anything at the end. We will see. Now, these go into there, in between those two pieces like that, I think. So that goes on top of that, underneath that, using one of these. Hang on a minute. No, it's just a regular short one. Okay. Well, that's going to be fiddly. Okay, that's all in place. Get a nut on there quickly. Or we lose it. Okay. Right. Now, I think we're more or less there actually. So we've got that that way round. I think we might be ready to put the wheels on now. I'm going to have to use these little green spaces. So the wheels go on this end of the chassis. That's quite a push, but it's a nice fit and over tight over squeeze that a little bit the other one goes through there okay now we better tighten those back down at some point I must have knocked those yeah not my favorite bit that little thing there okay and then I have to fix Torso. Uh, and it's that way up onto where? Onto. Wait a minute, I haven't got those bits. Oh no, we're that way around. Okay, so the torso is going to get fixed onto here. Oh no, I've got some bits left. super tight. Okay. All right. Nearly there. Last little bit is to fix that. So it 
goes bolt goes through there. Oh come on. I think that's it. I think we are fully assembled. And so that is the car. Oh, something's wrong here because <laughs> the wheels <laughs> don't touch the ground. I must have assembled that bit wrong. Oh, I see. You yeah, know, I see what I've done. Darn it. Fortunately, it does not require full disassembly. Just got to turn those that around so it's on the top. That can go through there. Oh, come on. Like that. I think it can anyway. Do you know what I'm going to do is turn that round to make that a bit more easy to access. Really, really hard to get in there. With my kind of sausage fingers, really difficult to get in there and get this little nut aligned so it doesn't cross thread. Right, there it is the car and the transformation action is really kind of that <laughs> it's not really like um, it's not very complicated but then we've got the robot so yeah, it's not, not a lot of complexity to the transformation action, it's just a car, and then it's a robot with a sword and whatever that thing is. Well, there we go. Now, let's have a quick review of what's left over. Bearing in mind that these leftovers might be a result of my failure to observe some small detail of the instructions. We've got two of those little spaces. We've got two of the kind of second size up screws. We've got one of the third size up screws. We've got three nuts. The fact that we've got three nuts and bolts matching suggests to me that I've missed something because if they'd have just done these by weight, I wouldn't have thought we would have had matching pairs. Got one little bracket. Not bad. So my review, I suppose, of this set. Things I liked. The pieces are actually quite well made. It's quite well manufactured. The instructions are more or less accurate, but they are very condensed. This whole exploded diagram, one exploded diagram for this piece, one exploded diagram really, okay with a little few pop outs for this piece, I feel like a few more steps would have been beneficial. And that's for me. So I think for a, I don't know, maybe some, maybe a young kid with a more agile brain than I've got would just find this a complete breeze. Who knows? The toy itself that oh the thing I really don't like is these plastic fittings here these just seem a bit meh in fact that one's already starting to break apart these little um, kind of clip things that go on the back of these pins they're just well, prone to coming off especially through handling so I don't think these plastic pin pieces here are all that good but then they're not a particularly critical part of the model anyway. So if those fall off, you'd still have 
a kind of working model. Transformation action, I mean, it's a bit lame, I think, really. Um, I get it. It's a transforming robot. But, yeah, it just does one kind of hinge thing that turns it from car, albeit, I mean, it's a car. Seat's in a weird position, isn't it? Um, into notionally a robot. I mean, it works. I shouldn't complain. It's it's all right. So assembling the thing, darn fiddly, especially for big sausage fingers like mine. I think some of the pieces, it's just, it's not even just a matter of getting your fingers in there. It's that when you've got three bolts going into the same space here, the order in which you put these in is critical. It would actually probably be better to do that bottom one first and then put these side ones on because it's difficult to get that bottom one in there once these side ones are protruding into the space there. So again, I think that comes back to the instructions would have been better if there was a bit more sequence to it. Anyway, that's probably enough wittering. Not a bad little model and not bad for a tenor, I would say. That's a that's a decent metal kit. There's potential here for somebody to take that apart and build something else with these pieces. There's enough flexibility and, and whatnot with the um, components that you could build some other little vehicle or some other little kind of construction with these pieces. There's enough bits and bobs there to do that, including, of course, the spare pieces. So. Not bad, not bad at all. Decent product for the price. It is a knockoff of Meccano, but then I think the patents have expired on Meccano now anyway, so it's free for all. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Nicely made, nice shiny pieces, decent finish, does the job, and the assembled model is pretty much what you see on the box. Oh, hang on, I've just noticed I have missed a bit because there's a steering wheel. Where is that on the instructions? Yeah, it's there. So this piece here, that bracket, one of these screws, one of those screws, one of those, and two nuts would form this little steering wheel that should go somewhere here. I think it goes onto that nut there. Should I put that on? I suppose I should for the sake of completeness. Let's do that. Oh, actually there should be a washer. But there ain't. So we've got a washer missing, I think. I believe. Yeah, well that's interesting. That washer there, 1075, is required. Yeah, I put it on there and it's not. Okay, I've done it wrong. Can you believe I made a mistake? Yeah, so that washer there is not part of that assembly. Let's get that out of there. What a terrible mistake. Right, washer's out. Put that back together. Because I'm not a massive fan of the fact that these, these pieces here splay out and fix onto a wider joint there. I don't 100% like that. I always, when I played with Meccano as a kid, I always used to dislike the instructions that tell you to bend pieces. I always felt like that. So, just destroying your Meccano set. This is a tad different though, probably, since it's uh, it's not really changing the geometry of those pieces. Okay, so that's our, that's that bit. And now we've got to assemble this steering wheel. So, washer, um, one of those. So one of those goes through, where's the bracket? Okay, yeah, it goes through the, the slot part of it, the spacer, the washer, and a nut. And again, now I can see I've made a mistake. Maybe I haven't. 
because then that is going to go in there. Oh boy, that's going to be nearly impossible. Right, bracket first. Which way around? Not that way around. Right, bracket in place. Steering wheel, which is comprised of a screw. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh. What's going on here? So, steering wheel, where were we? Now, I'm loath to go and get extra tools to assemble this because that's not the concept of this model. This is supplied with supposedly all of the tools you need to assemble it. So I think, I think I'm right in struggling like this to assemble it with the supplied tools because that's the product. I think we're there. Okay. Right, so actually the pieces left over is two bolts, two nuts, and one spacer. Unless, again, as I say, there's something else I've forgotten. So there it is, transformation robot, machine people incognito. Not bad for a tenor. That's a decent little kit. Parts are well finished. Looks nice and shiny. Assembly was not a breeze, but it took... There's several hours of assembly here, I think, even for somebody who knows what they're doing. And, yeah, the only critique I would have is, yeah, there is, I believe, one error in the instructions that I found. And it's just a bit too condensed to make sense. Because there is a sequence to putting these things together. And if you don't get it right, you end up taking it apart, putting them back together again to get things in the right order. So the assembly could do with some more sequencing. Apart from that, pretty good. And whether or not there's fun or frustration in putting that together really kind of depends on your level of patience. Fish finger sandwiches for lunch. Now I fancied some tartar sauce with my fish finger sandwiches, but I haven't got any. Tartar sauce is normally made from mayonnaise mixed with cornichons and capers chopped up, which I also don't have. We do have this. This is my Alexander's and three-cornered leek and hogweed lacto-fermented pickle, which isn't the same, obviously, as capers and cornichons, but it has similarities. We'll chop it up a bit smaller. That's about right. Into this little dish. Really. Good squeeze of mayonnaise, that might be enough. That looks about right. Mm -mm. Oh my gosh, that's really good. It's not exactly tartar sauce, but it's good for all of the same reasons. It's creamy, it's tangy, it's aromatic, it's slightly fruity, really good. Happy with that. Eva, be quiet. Now, here's the thing. Some people like their sandwiches cut diagonally. Some people like them cut straight across. Some people apparently like them cut this way, so you've got an equal bit of crust and top and bottom crust on each slice. Ah. Uh, and all of those people think they are absolutely right. So just to confound all of you, that's how we're doing it today. Ten fish fingers would have been better than five, but Jenny wants some. Hmm, that's really good. And that fake tartar sauce hits the spot exactly. Works really well with fish. Obviously this is Alexander's, this is seaside vegetables. So it's no surprise that that should go with fish. So my tomato plants, bit of a disaster really. There was a bit of a cold snap just after I planted all the seeds. I think it must have killed them off. I have been watering them. All I've got is three plants of Moneymaker, one of Gardener's Delight, one of Marmande, two of my artichokes came up, 
two, four, six, eight of my chilies, eight out of 12 of my chilies, and that's it. And they're really far behind as well. I probably did start a bit late, but it's been, I think the cold, I should have had these indoors probably. Anyway, you live and learn. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I've been out and bought some tomato plants. So I'm gonna get these up to the upstairs greenhouse, get that prepared and we'll plant them up. The soil inside the greenhouse is dry as a bone. And so rather than try and make that usable this year, I'm gonna use grow bags and then we will use these grow bags to kind of enrich the soil, give it some moisture retention, maybe for next year. Maybe next year we'll grow them in the border. Now there is almost room to have two grow bags side by side here along this border, but I think I've decided I'm gonna try and give them a bit more space than that. So they've got some space to grow this way. They are gonna be quite close together that way because each of these bags has three places for holes. So anyway, I'm gonna get these bags open, get the tomatoes planted in there. I'm just going to do that rather than cut this whole thing out and cut an X on there. Okay, and I'll plant my tomatoes into those. Okay, a cane thrust through each place, which I will tie into this cane at the top here just to steady it. And then the plants can be tied into those canes. Let's get some tomato plants planted. I've gone for a kind of broad spread of varieties like I tried to do with seeds. So we'll start off with Gardener's Delight. I don't want to waste this compost, so I'll just shove that up around the edges so I can get the plant down in there. Okay. Decent little root ball there. And then we'll just get it pressed into place. That's looking good. And I'll tie it in with a bit of soft string. Right, I'll get the rest in. Alrighty, so that's 10 tomato plants planted. I'll give them a good water in. I've put the labels by each one because we've got 10 different varieties here. So this would be a good chance to actually evaluate which ones are better than others. What I might do is actually cut some holes in the middle and sink a pot in between each plant so that I can water into the pot and it won't just run off. But for now, I'm sure that'll do. These big planters are quite thirsty though, so I'll give them a good water now. And I'll probably come back and water them again tonight as it soaks all along. So 10 tomatoes, I've got a couple more bags because I've got my seeds, which might still come along. So we've got the other side of the greenhouse here, we can grow some more tomatoes. Gonna be a lot of tomatoes if this is successful, but that's okay because we can pickle them, we can dry them, we can give some away. Things are coming along very nicely in the upstairs greenhouse here. These tomatoes are really taking off. I need to clear this side here and put another couple of grow bags in there. Over this side, we're gonna grow cucumbers and aubergines and peppers. But I don't know if you've noticed, there's a pane of glass missing. We've got an old garden gate there just for the moment to keep the cats out of the greenhouse, but I need to replace that glass. Fortunately, replacing the greenhouse glass is not rocket surgery, so I just need to... Oh, blimey. That's an interesting old bucket there. Look at that. <laughs> Piece of rail there. Some weird clamps of some sort. I don't know what they're from. Scaffold clamps, by the look of it. Okay, and we'll just uh, take our makeshift cat gate out of the way. Okay, now replacing the glass is not difficult, except that the way greenhouse glass works is this top sheet here is sitting on top of the sheet below. So I can't just replace straight into there. I am gonna have to take this pane out, put the other pane in, and then put this one back. So, there are just these little spring clips. I'll get you in closer so you can see how they work. So just these little wire spring retaining clips and they just come out. Probably a pair of pliers would have helped here. If I can get it out of one of that. Oh, it's gone somewhere. Ping. Okay, I got it. Okay, and when I take the last one of these out, obviously I've got to be careful because this pane of glass will just fall. So supporting it in the middle, I'm just going to get the last clip out. 
There it goes. Okay. And that pane just comes out. So there are some bits of ivy that have grown in there, so we might as well clear them out while we're at it. And then so starting from the bottom, that pane of glass goes in there. And for the moment I can reach the clips through here. Shut up! This wire clip just goes on like this into there. See there's a little piece there that sticks out. So that goes in there like that. And then the other end of the spring, a little bit fiddly. Again, a pair of thin nosed pliers would probably help there. But that's now clipped in place. That glass is pretty sound and in place. So now I've got the first pane in place, we need to place the second one on there. But to stop it just falling and sliding down, we've got these little clips, little kind of S-shaped clips. And those will just sit on the edge of the bottom pane there like that. And the top pane will just catch on those and be held in place. I've got my spring clips ready. I'll put them up here in the gutter so I don't lose them. And it should be a case of just Clipping that onto those things there and into place. And then put the spring clips in. Yeah, I know. The birds have a lot to say. Eva, would you get out of the greenhouse? So obvious question, why didn't I clean this glass before I installed it? The glass is actually really thin and fragile until it's fitted. And so once it's actually in the frame, it's got a lot more integrity. So I will clean this after I've fitted it and clipped it into place. So last little clip going in now. I've just got to make sure that the, the two little nibs sort of tuck down the edge there behind the pane of glass. There we go. Last clip. There we go. Job's a good one. And I did eventually find the little spring clip that went ping. It was down here in the undergrowth. So now in here, I can get my grow bags in. These are going to have cucumbers and aubergines in. But we've also got a bit of space along the front here. So I've got some slightly cheaper, smaller grow bags. And what I'm going to do with these is put them on this side in the front there and my peppers which won't grow as tall as the cucumbers are going to be in these front bags so yep that'll do it i might even get another small grow bag in that end so we've got two more spaces in that grow bag there those will probably be more tomatoes we've got two cucumber plants and a uh, aubergine and then room for something else here maybe a melon not sure I mentioned earlier but the reason for cutting the cross in the holes here for the tomato plants instead of actually cutting out a square is it just keeps all of the plastic together for recycling so when I get to the end of the growing season I can empty the compost out somewhere and reuse it on the garden but the plastic I can rinse off and we'll find a way to recycle that and it'll all be in one piece. So in terms of weeds here at Shrimp Cottage we've got a lot of Spanish bluebells which unfortunately Spanish bluebells do cross pollinate with our native English bluebells and that's not a great thing. I was hoping to get English bluebells established in the woods here, but I think I probably won't because if they're close to these, they'll cross pollinate with these and then we'll create a, a kind of hybrid, a pool of hybrid bluebells that uh, it'd be better if we just didn't do that. We do have a bit of ivy here and there, but it's generally pretty well behaved actually. There's a lot in the woods, but it belongs there. Uh, but we've got a little bit here and there, which we can just pull off. The one thing that is a potential problem is this. This is ground elder. Now it's only in one little corner of the garden at the moment, but I am gonna try and eradicate it from here. It's an edible plant and I do love eating it, but it's also very invasive. If you're a gardener, you'll know that ground elder is a very invasive and much hated weed. So we've got a little bit of it here and there in this corner of the garden. So there's a bit more there. So I'm not usually one for chemical warfare, but I am going to use weed killer on this. 
and I'm gonna wait for it to dry out and I'll paint it on the leaves so that I'm just killing that plant. It's only in this one little corner of the garden, right by the front gate, so I think we have a chance of eradicating it. Just out for a walk, how about this thing? This is a black oil beetle. Quite a grotesque looking critter, isn't it? Huge abdomen. Not really very safe here on the path. I think I'll move this onto the grass so it can be safe from being squished. Black oil beetle, today's insect friend. Today's insect friends live in these little holes here. These are the nests of solitary bees. I'm going to see if I can catch one coming home. There we go. Just down here. See it go down the hole? It's a solitary bee, some sort of minor bee. And this is in the lawn here at Shrimp Cottage, so we've got solitary bees nesting in the grass. We shall have to be a little bit careful that we don't disturb them. And these bees don't sting, so they are absolutely no threat or problem for us. They're off collecting pollen and nectar, which they will deposit down inside these underground nests, and they lay their eggs under there, then they'll earth it up again. And later in the year, the bee larvae will pupate inside there and come out, and that's the next generation of bees. And these are possibly the same kind of bees that are preyed upon by the black oil beetle. It's solitary bees like this that they prey on. But I've noticed a curious thing. These are solitary bees, but they are behaving like a colony. So it's not just that they're clustered in one area here. That could be as simple as them liking the quality of the soil here. But I've noticed from sitting here watching them come and go that they are departing and arriving in groups. Even though they're solitary nests, they're taking flight and returning in unison, in little groups. So presumably there's some kind of social stuff going on here, even though they are solitary in terms of their nesting. Now I was going to try and get you some close-up footage of them going into their holes, but it turns out that's actually quite difficult to do, because I think they're perceiving my camera as a bird. Every time I move my camera anywhere near them, they just drop to the ground and stop moving, and I think that is a defensive strategy to save them from being eaten by birds. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to get any close-up footage because even if I leave the camera there, they just stay frozen until I move away. I think, in all honesty, it's about time I left them alone. Today I'm at Lyme Regis. Lyme Regis is probably the fossil capital of the Dorset coast, the Jurassic coast here. I'm not just looking for fossils today though. I'm going to have a wander along. There's a historical landfill over there where as I understand it, Victorian refuse is washing out onto the beach and we're going to pick through it, do a bit of mudlarking, maybe do a bit of fossil hunting as well, see what we can find. I am by far not the only person looking on the beach today. We're heading along that way though. I'm going to head down here. I don't know that I can actually get down at the other end of this promenade. So I'm going to head down to the beach here. And over there, so over there we've got Charmouth. And then further round over there, that's Sea Town, and that's Golden Cap over there. We're not going to walk as far as Charmouth today because my car is parked here at Lyme. And the, the kind of landfill that's collapsed is somewhere over here. So that's where we're going to be heading first, I think. Let's get onto the sand because that looks like easier going. 
So fossils one might find at Lyme Regis, ammonites, belemnites, uh, ichthyosaur bones, various dinosaur teeth, I think turtle fossils here as well, pieces of turtle shell. I'm heading around the corner here because I've timed my visit to coincide with the falling tide. So tide is still going out for a couple of hours, so I won't get cut off here. Interesting shapes in the rocks here. I think these are the very degraded remains of large ammonites. Yeah, on some of the less worn ones you can still see the kind of spiral form. Oh well, we'll keep looking. Now, didn't think I would be, but I'm clearly not the only person to have had this idea of coming here today. So, a bunch of other people mudlarking, rummaging through the remains over there. Now that I'm down here on the foreshore, well, there's a piece of old china, probably from that landfill. While I'm down here on the foreshore, I am going to keep my eyes peeled for fossils because this is the best place to find a sort of good quality, durable ammonites and other things. I'm seeing a lot of bits of pottery, glass, and of course they've all come from this, what was a landfill here that's slumped into the sea. Right, coming up to the first edge of, so this was a Victorian landfill. Well, <laughs> That's an old boiler, isn't it? So yeah, this was a, a landfill from Victorian times, um, but it was used up until the 1970s, I believe. So the top layer is quite modern. The bottom layers are older. And so we hope to find some kind of, maybe bits of Victorian knickknacks and cast-offs. Another bit of a boiler or something. That's a firebox. So a lot of what we got here is quite industrial, but I'm just going to look for a good spot and have a little route around in amongst the rocks, see what we can find. Yeah, I think we'll go out here where whatever we find might have been washed off a little bit. <clears throat> so again, still very industrial here. That's an old file. fireplace or something. Now I'm not going to dig through this lot here because it's really really wet sticky clay right there and all, all around here you can see see that footprint there somebody's gone stood in that that's uh, a bit too claggy we're going to stick to the drier bits there's a bit of an old key I think there rather too rusted to make it worth taking home So lots of bits of metal in this area here and a piece of melted glass. So the landfill, a lot of the time stuff would have been dumped in there 
and then fires would be lit to burn it down and compact it down. So a lot of the glass in here is melted. Pieces, I think that's just a piece of steel that's rusted away in such a way to sharpen both ends. The kind of ends have rusted away. We'll have a little rummage around here because there's all sorts of interesting bits of metal here and maybe we'll find something else. This stuff here is the natural pyrite that's washed out of the cliffs. They're all plumbing there. It's a finial off of something. Iron finial perhaps off a railing. button that might be a button okay that could go that could be going in the bag so not really finding a whole lot there's an old garden fork there not really finding a whole lot of course this has all been picked over again and again by different people every time the tide goes out so Lots and lots of scrap steel on the top. Not really sure what else there is. Bits of melted glass. You know, possibly unexploded bombs. A bit of a fossil there. But I don't think I'll keep that. I'll just put it on the rock there, see if somebody else wants it. Lots of nails and bolts and stuff here. I'll have a little dig through this bit. This loose stuff. You never know what we might find. A little piece of embossed glass there. More than likely Actually, that looks like Gordon's. That's going to be a piece of Gordon's gin bottle. Another little piece of an ammonite imprint. Almost certainly a piece of a shoemaker's last there. maybe so still not really finding anything that screams take me home well, it's very industrial down this bit here I found that which I think is like the head or part of the head of a little like mineral hammer or pick or something maybe I don't know, do you recognise that? Let me know in the comments if you recognise that. I'm not taking it home. So another little piece there of what seems like it could be part of a tool. Almost. Almost. Seems like we have a... a kind of... bit of a hammer or something there. I don't know. I don't know what these are. Let me know if you know what that is. I think that is a piece of, I think that's like bronze. This one's steel, I think. And this as well. Looks like it might be a peg or a wedge of some sort. Or maybe the shoe off of, I don't know, maybe some, had some screw or something in there. Or it might be a wall anchor or something, I don't know. Anyway. Not finding a lot that I recognise. The trouble is with a lot of this iron stuff is it's rusted away in such a way that makes it look that like it has a different purpose. So this thing here, yeah, that point looks like it has a purpose, but I'm pretty sure this is just a rusted one of those. 
it's just that most of the metal has rusted away and that's what's left. Tide is getting to be nearly out as far as it goes, today at least. Still not really finding very much, although there is another little piece of ammonite there. Uh, found a bit of a car. The bowl of a spoon perhaps? <laughs> How about that then? Piece of a... I think that's like a bacon slicer. Now I think I might actually take that home because that steel would be quite good for making a knife. Lovely old ceramic insulator there from some electrical installation. Still got some of the copper wire wrapped around it. Right, I feel like I am getting into the kind of slightly older material here, so we'll keep looking. In front of an old stove here, there really is quite a lot of scrap metal on the beach here. I think that's an old oven. It's probably one of the trays there. It really kind of does need a bit of clean up, this beach. The council is apparently dealing with the problem by ignoring it. And how about that? Most of an engine from an Austin. Austin 7 maybe? Ah, oh, here's the other half of that car. Oh, and uh, the crankcase there as well. What a mess. So I can actually still smell the smoke from when this was burned. I can still smell all the burning. I'm finding various little bits of possibly vintage pottery here. Still not really finding anything that says take me home. So this is interesting, that little, little paste pot there from meat paste or fish paste and it's been melted where this landfill was burned. So there probably were fires on fires here when this was being filled up. A piece of a marmalade pot. It's quite an interesting little find there. This is a ceramic piece of electrical something or other. Made in England, crab tree. Yeah, just a little terminal block or something like that. Not keeping it. So, not finding very much of any great import. Is that a piece of... Is that a piece of bone? Is that a piece of ichthyosaur bone? It actually looks like it might be. I, think I might take that home and have a closer look at that. Found this little pin. Little metal pin. Presumably from a watch strap or something like that. Piece of steel cable. It's a really weird beach because it's a mixture of fossils and artifacts. Sort of uh, ancient and modern. I haven't really found anything that I think is that old. Oh look, I've just found a lovely little ammonite though. How about that? Little pyrotized ammonite. Quite good condition. Hopefully that will last. They don't always. Sometimes the pyrotized ones crumble away to nothing. But that's a keeper. Didn't really come here for the fossils actually. Came here for the mudlarking, for the digging about for stuff that has been through the landfill, but I'm not going to turn my nose up at a nice little ammonite like that. Lots of pieces of glass, that's a piece of window glass by the look of it. Another piece of melted bottle glass there. A piece of a bottle, but not a very old one because it's a screw top, so not especially ancient. I'm just going to keep digging around. I'm probably more or less done here to be honest because 
I don't think I'm actually going to come home with very much today. Little piece of pottery there. Can't quite make out what that design is on it. It's like a crocodile, but I don't think it is one. Another chunk of rusted steel cable here. Forbidden barley sugar. So this seems to be quite an interesting little spot here. We've got lots of bits of melted glass. Quite old pottery. Not quite so old pottery. Piece of tile edging there. Do you know what? I might take that home for the garden. It's a great old chunk of stuff to lug about, but we're going to be building some steps soon. And I think that would just be nice to have sticking out of the steps. So that's going in my pocket. I'll probably regret that. Let's look at the treasure. More of it up there, still to fall down. That's the old landfill. So you can see where it was filled in up to the cliffs. I recognise that. That's a piece of Green's Cornish ware. Seems to be quite a bit round here, so I think I'll have a little rummage in this bank here. There's a piece of a cut glass, I don't know, sweet dish or something like that there. There's a piece of old brass, a bit of a pen or something probably. It's not a shell casing. So I think I'll have a rummage around here because it looks like there's lots of small finds here. I haven't really found very much today, apart from a piece of an old bacon slicer and a piece of weird tile edging. I haven't found, I was hoping to find maybe a glass bead or something like that, but maybe I'm just not very good at this. I will have a little rummage in amongst these gravels here because this looks like it could be promising, but I've said that before. Anyway, probably time to call it a day. I also cut myself, so I need to get some antiseptic on that. Yep, that's it, I think. We'll head back to the car now up through the town. Might do a little bit of shopping in the very interesting little shops they've got in Lyme Regis. But I think that might be the end of my trip to Lyme Regis. I was hoping to find something identifiable in amongst all of this stuff, but most of what's here is broken glass, scrap metal, bits of bricks and rubble. Uh, maybe I'm just not very good at this though. Oh my goodness, there's somebody up there on the cliffs. That is insanity. Again, amazing place here. Not quite as spectacular, in my opinion, the landscape here as, or the seascape or beachscape as uh, Quantic's Head, but similar kind of idea where you've got these tilted layers trapping hundreds and hundreds of rock pools. This would be a fascinating place to bring your kids with a bucket and a little shrimping net. Have a wander out on here actually and see what we can see. Of course, at high tide, this is all covered up. Right, I'm not going to go any further than that because those rocks are weedy. That's um, falling over territory out there, although some brave souls are doing it. And there's still that guy up on the cliff. Absolute insanity, that is. Okay, so here's the wrap up of the items I found at Lime. That's the thing I thought might have been a button. I don't think it is. I think that's like the head of a, I don't know, there's a bit of brass and a bit of copper there. I think that's just a piece of, one of those pieces of scrap metal, perhaps some kind of bearing or just a fastener. Probably not anything very interesting. The only other things I found in terms of mudlarking that I wanted to bring home were these pieces of lead. Um, just that's, I think some of these are just pieces of melted lead that have been melted in all of the fire and whatnot that's been happening there. I just didn't want to leave lead on the beach really. Um, I will probably melt those down and make them into something, make a doorstop or something like that once I've collected up some more lead. The fossil finds from the beach, well here's the ammonite. It's only been 24 hours or so since I picked this up and you can see it's already starting to go dull and the, the luster has gone from it. Compare that to the ammonite that I found at Seatown more than a month ago. That one's still really nice and shiny. 
and it's it is just all to do with the layer that these were in these are probably different species of ammonite from different periods and this one has preserved really well this one will probably eventually just turn to dust anyway I think this piece is a bit of ichthyosaur bone or at least a bit of dinosaur bone of some sort I'll do a close-up picture of it I know I've been overly hopeful in the past about things I thought were pieces of dinosaur bone but this piece does seem consistent with images of an ichthyosaur rib that I've seen online from Lyme Regis so I think that could be what that is but let me know in the comments if you think differently one thing I know it isn't is fossilized wood because if that was a piece of uh, jet or coal it would mark paper and it doesn't so that's actually stone which I think means it's a piece of dinosaur bone, or at least something like that. But let me know in the comments what you think. I mean, I suppose it could be part of a fossilized plant stem that's actually fossilized and fully turned to stone. But as I say, it's consistent with what I saw in the image of a ichthyosaur bone from the same area. So that's it. And I've got to say, actually, I don't really think that was a hugely enjoyable trip. Lime Regis Beach, it's a lovely beach for fossils and for rock pooling and stuff. The town is gorgeous. The location is gorgeous. That huge stinking piece of landfill that's just oozing onto the beach is just a real eyesore. It probably ought to be cleaned up and taken off somewhere else and perhaps still just landfilled, but somewhere where it's not going to end up in the sea. I get that this does make it fun for mudlarkers although I think most of the good finds at least the current ones have been picked over and taken but I think it does ruin the beach I think a lot of that landfill was from the era when the dustmen took away dust literally ashes from fires from coal fires and wood fires in houses and so the dustbin men were taking away cartloads of ash as well as refuse and so a lot of what's there is just kind of the, the mushy, wet remains of all of that domestic ash. And as a result, it's really stinky and not that great. Anyway, that was my kind of mudlarking trip to Lyme Regis. They were enjoyable parts of the day, but not sure I'm going to bother doing that in that location again. As I say, for fossils and things, Sea Town, Charmouth, better pickings. Anyway, I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.